Now let me give you an example. Very recently, Ebola. Ebola did not just break out yesterday. In the 70s, actually in 1976, the first outbreak of Ebola was in the Congo, DRC. It was neglected because it was in some remote area of the Congo. As recent as 2012, there was another outbreak in Uganda. It probably hit a newspaper somewhere in some hidden column. Nobody spoke about Ebola. Oh, it's mm -hmm. poor people's disease, remote areas, an invisible world, a forgotten world. And then uh, Ebola broke out in 2014. It was no longer in the remote areas. It went into capitals of these countries in West Africa. But even more importantly, it crossed borders, deserts, oceans, and flew into Europe and the Americas. Then the world of, all of a sudden became aware of it because it touched the lives of the visible world. As long as it was in the forgotten world, hidden away from media, it did not matter. But our world is smaller than it was before. The price of inaction is what we are paying for today. $10 million a month to screen people entering Heathrow Airport. Sorry, $100 million a month. Cost of screening only. Mm -hmm. Not to talk about cost of treatments. The cost of health workers coming back from infected regions to the visible world. Isolation and quarantine. Had we taken action 50 years ago, Ebola will not be a crisis. I ask the question, why does the world have to wait until a problem becomes a crisis before we take action? We all say it. It's very simple. Prevention is better than cure. It is cheaper than cure. A hundred times cheaper. The same thing today is happening in the rural areas. As long as we neglect rural areas, as long as we fail to make it a priority to invest in infrastructure, in social services, energy, connectivity, people will continue to migrate from rural areas to urban areas. Large cities is not equivalent to better cities. They only end up into larger slums. And what happens? Rhetoric, extremism, we know the consequences. If they do not die in the high seas trying to cross, they become a problem when they land on our shores. Today, about 2.5 billion people depend on small-scale agriculture for their lives and livelihoods. But these farmers are the largest investors in agriculture. If we give them the means and the tools, they can lift themselves out of poverty. We cannot lift them out of poverty, but we can catalyze, we can support, we can facilitate. And when we make the conditions good for them, they themselves will lift themselves out of poverty. And that is the difference. Development is not something we do for people. Development is what people do for themselves. Our role is to support them to facilitate, to create the conditions that make it possible for them to grab the opportunities. Farmers and poor people are not waiting for government handouts. I can tell you this, whether it's in Asia, whether it's in Africa, whether it's in Latin America, they, look, they are looking for economic opportunities. Handouts is an insult. It's not dignified. They don't want handouts because they become dependent on governments. They want to become independent. They want the same things that you and I want for our children. Excellencies, ladies and gentlemen, as you know, or you may not know, for about 40 years, IFAD has worked with poor people all over the world. And I myself, for the last 35 years, I worked as a research scientist, both in Africa and in Asia. 
and my experience in the field as a scientist, as a research scientist, and today for the last eight years, working in a research institution like IFAD, investing in rural women and men has shown me the power of development. I have seen time and time again that it is possible to improve productivity, income and nutrition, even in the most marginalized lands, environments, here in the Gulf countries, elsewhere in Africa, in Latin America and Asia. Now in a few minutes, I'll be sharing with you uh, some of the three most important lessons that I have learned over the years for sustainable transformative development. But before, we, before I do that, I believe we have a video. There's a project that IFAD supported, a project in Burkina Faso in West Africa. It is better known for the water management, the water management that has transformed the lives and the environment. Let's watch the video. In Burkina Faso, Sahel region, Sibiri Kebre waits for rain. It's not a new story in this semi-arid part of West Africa, often plagued by drought. But according to local farmers here, weather patterns are changing. The weather is changing and we're worried. Every day we must think about how we will survive. It affects our lives. It affects the environment. Trees are disappearing, and there's a loss of soil fertility, so it's a big problem. And scientists predict it will only get worse. Not only will farmers have to grow their sorghum and millet with less rainfall, but they'll also have to deal with greater variability of water flow. Greater variability means that you might get 20-25% of the entire annual rainfall in one afternoon. So everything that you've planted is washed away. With just one growing season and little more than 500 millimeters of rainfall per year, changes like this can spell disaster, as Kebre knows from experience. Ten years ago, there was drought and serious famine. I had to sell everything I had, including my donkey cart, in order to buy food for the family. To help farmers like Kebre adapt to climate changes, the UN's International Fund for Agricultural Development, or EFAD, has supported a number of projects that work together with farmers to develop soil and water retention techniques, like these half-moon-shaped pits. When the rain comes, they hold moisture more efficiently, and the manure added to the bottom increases soil fertility. The real impact has been in the moisture retained in the soil, which means we are able to grow more crops. With the increased production, we are much more food self-sufficient. Digging circular planting pits and building stone walls that prevent water runoff are part of the strategy. But the biggest payoff may come from planting trees. Tossing the cuttings from young bagana trees over a field improves the soil's nutrients for growing crops. But these trees also provide food for animals and people. Even more importantly, a compound released by leaves into the atmosphere actually stimulates the formation of clouds and rainfall. IFAD says up to 300,000 hectares of land in Burkina Faso have been recovered using these techniques, which is not only helping farmers adapt to climate changes, but increase their harvests. On average, the harvest was 300 to 400 kilograms per hectare, or 600 kilograms at best. Today, with these techniques, production has been raised to 1,400 and 1,500 kilograms per hectare. So you see the difference. It's more than doubled. From one of the few high spots near the town of Yako, it's evident what kind of impact farmers are having on greening the landscape. Yet farmers and scientists agree there's no room for complacency. It's predicted rainfall here will continue to decrease from 500 to around 310 millimeters per year. And as it does, these techniques will become even more crucial, says IFAD's Christiana Sparacino. Without these techniques, we wouldn't be able to harvest the Sahel and we wouldn't be able to produce enough to eat for the farmers and for the populations of Burkina Faso. And this is the way we need to go if we want to, if we want to um, have uh, uh, self-sufficiency in, uh, in agriculture production in the countries of the Sahel. 
In the meantime, when the rain finally comes this year, farmers like Kebre will be ready. Thank you. Uh, as you can see, uh, small improvements to traditional water harvesting techniques and planting trees to fix nitrogen in the soil can work miracles. As you heard on the video, around 300,000 hectares of land in Burkina Faso have been rehabilitated. An additional 80,000 tons of food is being produced every year. The impact on lives has been profound. The rate of acute childhood malnutrition has been reduced by half. Production has risen by 25% for nearly all the project participants. And when the project ended, a review found that an estimated 50,000 people had moved themselves out of poverty. The techniques used in Burkina Faso are gaining momentum throughout the Sahel. Farmers in northern Ghana have visited to learn the techniques and new projects in Mauritania and Senegal are testing these approaches. The project in Burkina Faso succeeded because right from the start, if had worked side by side with farmers themselves to improve their own local technologies and promote local innovations. The half moon or demi lune as is described is a practice that they have done in the past, but not systematically. Digging small pits and putting a little bit of uh, natural manure is something they have done in the past. But they used to just spread the manure over the fields, and it was washed away with the first rain. So these structures are already existing, or this, this approach are already existing methodologies, which we just used a little bit of what we call common sense to improve. And so, what are the lessons I have learned myself from these? The first of them is we should not be afraid to listen and learn from poor farmers. They may not have PhDs in agronomy or in pathology or plant physiology, but they know the conditions on the ground better than us, better than the experts we send as consultants. Often, we use our scientific expertise to improve a method that farmers have found effective for hundreds of years that can yield more impressive results than any amount of expensive equipment and technology. And when we do develop new technology, we must ensure that it gets to those farmers who need them the most. So not only must we ensure that we do our research with the farmer, we must make sure our research reaches the farmer. Working with the local community is also important because farmers are unlikely to adopt a new technology or method of farming if they do not truly appreciate its value. The history of development is filled with good ideas that never took root because the experts failed to establish true partnerships with the people on the ground. And what is my second lesson? We must take advantage of everything that science has to offer. But when I say science, I also mean the softer sciences, the social sciences, human behavior, dynamics of policies, as well as the biological sciences, the chemistry, and the physics. But oftentimes, as scientists, we ignore the softer sciences, which are sometimes more important than the hard sciences. I have seen over the years that no amount of advances in research and development will have their desired impact on food and nutrition security unless the social aspects of a community are adequately addressed. I'll give you an example. Last year, actually in September, I visited a project in Ethiopia where the social issues had, not, had been neglected. There were no farmers' organizations, as simple as just a small farmers' organizations. The men dominated the discussion all the time. The women were excluded. These farmers had not seen any improvement in their yields, in their incomes, or nutrition amongst their family. They were, not able, they were not even able to use a simple wooden box to create their produce, tomatoes and potatoes. 
And so it was obvious there was very little by way of community cohesion or social cooperation. Now, on the contrary, just about one hour drive away was a stark contrast to a project approximately, as I said, an hour away, where the yields had become higher, incomes had increased, and nutrition had improved. They had established a water users association, a simple water users association, and the membership ensured that water was evenly distributed amongst the community. The difference was that at the second project, women were active participants and had even organized themselves into a cooperative. They had a voice in their community and, of course, their businesses. The experience shows that investing in the empowerment of rural women, I do not know about city women, so I'm talking about rural women. <laughs> rural women opens doors for entire communities. When you invest in a rural woman, actually we have a saying in parts of Africa, when you invest in a woman, you invest in a community. When you invest in a man, you invest in an individual. And so we found that the entire community had strengthened their food and nutrition security to improve their entire social and economic well-being. Women, investing in women is an investment that makes simple economic sense. Because in these rural communities, women play several roles. They are caretakers, of course, of the family, of children, but they are better investors of, of their resources. It makes sense because in many parts of the developing world, women account to close to 50% of the labor force. But unfortunately, as most of you know, these women do not have equal access to fertilizer, to training, or to financial resources. Some of them cannot even have a bank account. But we have found that investing in women Sometimes we get 20 to 30 percent higher yields. And by simply giving them the same resources as the men, would reduce the number of undernourished people in the world by up to 150 million. This has been as shown by FAO. Moreover, as I said before, rural women are more likely to ensure that the benefits of farming go to the family and the community, not just an individual. So development needs to respond to the needs of the communities we serve rather than our own needs or because of our desire to see our discoveries in the field. I know as a scientist it is very exciting to develop a new technology in the lab and to take it to the field. But why give poor farmers in Africa a new seed variety that increases yields when the farmer doesn't even have access to, to safe storage, when the farmer doesn't even have a nearby market to sell, and when there's no road to transport the, ex, uh, the additional uh, produce, and they are forced to sell at farm gates at lower prices. And this then leads me to my third and final lesson, partnership. Partnership between producers and the private sector and the public sector. Now, you see, I distinguish producers from the public sector because oftentimes public sector in normal parlance is government. And this is what at IFAD we call the four Ps, public, private, producer, partnerships. And one of IFAD's strengths is its ability to organize these producers into organizations, farmers' organizations, or better still, cooperatives. Now, what does the four P mean? Governments can create an enabling policy environment that encourages the private sector to invest in smallholder agriculture. So government creates the enabling environment with the right policies. It encourages the private sector to come in and invest. So they can create the social safety net so that smallholder farmers in developing countries can risk planting a new seed variety or diversify into new crops or can even buy another cow or another goat to increase their resilience. So in partnership, government can also create the infrastructure needed for smallholders to fully participate in markets. In partnership, we can also build relationships between organizations of small producers and private companies like, we do, like IFAD is doing with Unilever and Intel. But let me stress that partnership must be inclusive and genuinely collaborative. The private sector gains on the supply side, 
Small producers benefit from links to secure markets, access to technology, services, innovation, and knowledge. What does government gain from? Taxes. More taxes are paid. And when the citizens are happy, I can assure you, there's stability and there's peace. And that is what every government wants. Excellencies, ladies and gentlemen, a world without small farmers would be a hungrier world, a world with less biodiversity, and a world with even more crowded cities. But it will be difficult for smallholders to survive in a world of climate change and growing risk unless we ourselves make it a priority to develop their resilience. As the world's population and the cities grow, so too does the interdependence between urban and rural areas. Neither can develop sustainably without the other. Vibrant rural economies result in a flow of economic benefits between rural and urban areas so that nations have balanced and sustained growth. Let me conclude. Our cities need the food that is grown in rural areas. The food on our tables started from a farm. Although you think a nice apple or a nice steak comes from a grocery store. The grocery store gets it from farmers. As I have said before, agriculture and rural development provide a pathway to employment, wealth creation, and economic growth. They are the basis for social cohesion among societies, and they are the precursors for global peace and security. By working in partnership for inclusive development and investing in research that benefits poor farmers and the wealthier alike, we can unleash the power of small-scale agriculture to end poverty and hunger and to drive the economic growth of nations. Thank you for your patience and for listening. Thank you. Yeah, thank you very much. Uh, you, you touched on a point which I, well, decided not to raise here. But the issue here, and it's very clear, at least I can speak for on sub-Saharan Africa, one of governance. Uh, you talked about Vietnam, you talked about China, you can talk about Cambodia even. It's true, you know, uh, 30, 30 years ago, Vietnam was a food deficit country. We all know it very well. But 20 years later, Vietnam was exporting food, uh, rice. Today, Vietnam is either the first or the second largest exporter of rice. Now, the interesting thing is that over 60% of Rice farmers in Vietnam grow less than two hectares each. So they are small producers. So it can be done. But the issue, I think, in Africa, if Africa in a broader sense, but specifically sub-Saharan Africa, is one of governance issue, corruption, and lack of visionary leadership. It's as simple as that. And I say that in front of heads of states. If you, I don't know if you saw my letter to heads of state last June. Uh, an open letter. Yes, yeah. And this was the issue. It's very simple. Rwanda is doing it. For those of you who know the history of Rwanda, Ethiopia is a good success story. Meles, before his pa he passed away. I don't, I don't care the form of government, whether it's socialist or democratic or dictatorship, I don't, that's not my issue. It's basically visionary leadership. There's no reason why any country in Africa that is well endowed should be actually receiving Overseas Development Assistance, ODA. Simply managing the resources available in each country. Now, I'm not talking about the extractive industry. I'm talking about illicit financial, financial outflows. It costs Africa five, sorry, $50 billion a year. $50 billion and rising. Tax collection, proper taxation, proper collection and redistribution of taxes will give them another $100 billion a year. We just came from the minister. We said, what is the problem with Greece? La taxes. They fail to pay taxes. Simple as that. So the point here is that. In spite of what we say, yes, several, no, seven or eight of the fastest growing economies in the world today are in sub-Saharan Africa. Seven or eight of the fastest growing economies. But how are they growing? Extractive industries. 
oil, gas, minerals, diamond, gold. But where is the money going to? Where is the social development in my own country? We know what the problems are. It's as simple as that. But unless we have leaders that are honest to their people and are willing to see development equitably distributed among this population, we're going to continue with the same problem. And I'm bold to say that many of these countries should not receive any penny of development assistance. Yeah, but, but see, for me, for me, the mathematics is very simple. I mean, it's common sense and it makes economic, economic business sense as well. We are all ganging together in partnership to eliminate poverty and hunger. That's a given. We all have the same objective. Now, when you want to solve a problem, or when you are sick, what do you do? You go to a medical doctor for a diagnosis and they tell you, oh, your headache is caused because you have an ulcer or because you have something in your liver. Now, the headache is the symptom. The headache, the headache is not the disease. Remember that. Mm -hmm. The headache can be a little finger, an infection in the finger that gives you a headache. So when you find a disease, what do you do? You begin to treat the disease where it occurs in your body. So where is poverty and hunger? 75% of the poor are in rural areas. It's a given. We all know it. FAO has the statistics. IFPRI has the statistics. So if poverty, the majority of poverty, or the poor and the hungry live in rural areas, where do you go and tackle poverty? In rural areas. But it's not just the area, it's not just the people. Poverty is also associated with the environment. So if you want to invest, you invest in the rural areas. Give them the minimum of good roads. Access. It, as I said, it doesn't make sense to tell, oh, please double your food production. We're going to give you new seeds and access to fertilizer and irrigation. Fantastic. So they make more, they grow more. But you don't have roads, you don't have energy, you, you don't have social services. What do you think the children are going to do? You have, they have doubled their yields, but what are they growing with? They're still using the hoe to till the, the soil. You think, as a child, I would want to do the same thing as my father? To stay in that rural area and use the hoe to produce more food when there's no energy for my children to even study at night? So we must invest in the rural. We have to transform the rural area. This is as simple as that. Look at the Emirates, 1985, if you came here. It's not what it is today. But you have rural areas. The minister was just telling us, what is the name of this village? It used to take how many hours? Now it takes one hour to go by car. I don't remember. He said, now you have dual carriage. He said, in the 60s, in the 60s, they went to school. It took three hours to get to school. They started at 4 a.m. or 5 a.m to be there at 8, and they finish at 2, to be home at 5. Today, it's a car. But you have invested. You've transformed. My country discovered oil <laughs> long ago. So the point is visionary leadership that is there to serve its people. Kagame, you may say what you like. I, I admire the guy because of what he's done to Rwanda. If you have been to Rwanda in the last 10 years, you will have seen the transformation. Ethiopia. If you have been in the open in the 80s, they were lining up to buy food. But look at, not just, not just Addis Ababa. Go to, the, go to the interior and see what is happening there. Mm -hmm. I mean, it, it can be done. It's been done in China. It's been done in Vietnam. So why can't we do the same thing? If our leaders can be at least a little bit conscious. They say, well, you put some in your pocket, but leave the rest on the table for others. Thank you, thank you very much. <clears throat> uh, you cannot continue to import food because the prices is going up and sometimes it will get to the point where you cannot even get the food to buy because of the impact of climate change. Uh, in uh, 2000, the GCC countries together were about uh, between 25 and about 25 billion, billion dollars were spent on importing food. It is projected by, that by 2020, your import bill will be about 52 to $56 billion a year. That's a lot of money. 
And with oil prices, it may stabilize at 50 to $60. That's about half what it was mm -hmm. uh, this time last year, probably. So definitely, that is, the solution is not in importing more food. But I think the GCC, when it was created, it was those who created the GCC had a vision of identifying amongst your member states. I mean, no, I mean, triple AI, triple AI yeah, idea, I, yeah. I think, yes. Yeah. Uh, triple, the Arab Authority. The Arab Authority. It's the Arab Authority. You identified countries where you can invest. <laughs> Sudan was one, and a lot of investment was put by the triple AI ID. So also was uh, Egypt, and also parts of, 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 of uh, the GCC countries as well. However, I think large-scale agriculture is not always the solution to everything. It is possible, yes, but I think we have to look at it. Even in, this develop, in the developed country, even in your country, Netherlands, you have large-scale, you have small-scale. One of the most efficient agricultural systems are in your country. So it's both large and small-scale. I think what we have not exploited enough in the GCC is how to maximize the outputs of your small and medium scale enterprises. Farmers as well as, you know, herders, your small ruminants, for example, sector. There are areas where you have enough water that you can optimize. And irrigation is, I mean, it's every day there's an improvement. I remember growing up well, in, in, when I was in, in Kansas, as she mentioned, large sprinklers, you know, but today you can, as we say, one drop can give you a, a crop. A, one drop per crop, or crop but yeah, crop, drop per, per crop, exactly. And you can optimize with micro-irrigation systems that it goes to the roots. The same thing with fertilizer application. Rather than spread it, spread, spread, spreading it, you put it, so there are opportunities to optimize the productivity level of your small and medium scale enterprises. We have been having discussions, you know, with some of your, of your, of your experts, of your ministries, on how IFAD can support, because this is our area of expertise. The other is that I think you have not also collectively optimized your date production. You see, dates is not just also for eating. Mm -hmm. You can do a lot with it. Oils, various oils, mm -hmm. and sugar substitutes. But I'm not sure that you have actually developed the, 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 uh, the byproducts exactly. And this is where, again, there's possibility for you, for, for, for you to bring the expertise and, and have not necessarily very large infrastructure. Even where the family, families can have their own communities, can even have their own small industries for processing, at least up to a stage where they add value to it before they sell to the bigger companies. So I do believe that there is, of course, partnership for the triple AID can benefit, you know, and help to maximize whatever the principles that enacted the creation of the triple AIS, which I think you haven't fully exploited. Then also to, to, uh, to invest in your SMEs and create opportunities for them also to increase their productivity level. And here I think there's ap uh, ample opportunities for partnerships with IFAD, with FAO, and other institutions, of course, with ICBA uh, here. Mm -hmm. yes. Well, first of all, um, IFAD only works in rural areas. Our investment is only for rural people. So we say IFAD, investing in rural people. Uh, of course, we work with urban communities if it Im involves transferring technologies to, urban, to rural areas. And in working with rural areas, one of our priorities is empowerment of rural women for the reasons I gave you. Uh, even in research, we found the same thing. Uh, women must be the primary focus in the initial stages of any development initiatives. We have seen cases where neglecting them does not give you optimum results. So empowerment of women is very key. The other thing that I must mention is that we work at the community level and we respond to the needs of the community at the grassroots. And that is why our, we now started about five years ago to decentralize and have country offices where we outpost our, our staff. 
but we cannot be in every country. So we're very selective, either because the country is very fragile, and fragility is not in terms of war and the rest of it. It can be even climate, but the fragility also of, 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 of the systems. Are the institutions strong enough to absorb any project? Can they implement it? Can they design? So we have to work with strengthening the institutions. You see, I don't believe that the solution in a country that has problems is by putting more money into it. So, well, let's give them more money, more budget support. Probably the problem is not that. It is the institutions are not strong enough. So we must strengthen institutions. We just, last two years ago, we started a project with FAO, where we uh, allocated a $2 million grant to FAO to work in 10 countries, working with national systems and helping to strengthen national systems, both in the design of projects, in the monitoring of projects, in the evaluation, in data collection, and of course in the accounting of, uh, of, 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 of uh, activities. So, and we realize that and we're, doing a mid, yeah, we're doing a review this year to see whether there's any, any progress. So strengthening the institutions. Like I said, you have to go and find out what the problem is, not to try to treat the symptom, but to treat the cause of the problem. Um, we have, I believe, the only program today that is addressing adaptation to climate change by small producers. We call it ASAP, Adaptation of Smallholder Agriculture to Climate Change. And what, what we're doing is not totally novel. It's basically an organized system where we focus on building the resilience of farmers using meteorological data better. A simple water, rain, um, weather station collecting data, for example or simple you know, uh, uh, techniques of uh, conservation agriculture. We call it conservation agriculture, but it's simple. Mulching the soil and all the rest of it. And also community, community action, you know. So, and so we have, you have, of course, productivity increases is key. Empowerment of women, uh, natural resource management involving, of course, climate change, capacity building, and of course, partnerships. Partnerships that take the producers as the center point. They must be at the center of these partnerships. The other one is the value chain. Value chain but also linked to markets. What we're trying to do is working with youth more and more is to, for, for youth to appreciate the fact that when you say farming or agriculture, it's not only putting the seed in the soil or milking the cow. That is one step of the food production process. They can go into buying, organized purchases of produce and transporting it, or even value addition by simply storing the food. So when you let's see, agri food production is a whole value chain from production to markets, or even providing uh, IT information to farmers about when to sell, where to sell, you know, giving them it's because farmers don't often have the capacities. Or oh, if you take your produce to, to Riyadh, this is the price. And the cost of transportation is not worth it. So don't go to Riyadh, even though you can get the price better. Many people do not think, they say, oh, I can get two, uh, two dollars more. But the cost of transportation is five dollars. <laughs> you see, these are simple things. But working at the grassroots, and as I said, one of the things we've learned is that listen to the farmers. Listen to them very well, because sometimes we think that we know so much and we, at the end we, we are frustrated. So it's, it's basically community-driven development and working at the grassroots. But more importantly for us, we have to go to the remotest parts of the world, you know, where they are oftentimes unreachable. And that is where poverty is. We cannot achieve MDG1 by just working on the peripheries of the urban areas of the capital city. You have to go to the most remote parts of the world where there's actually abject poverty. Yeah, I'm glad, I'm glad you raised this issue. <clears throat> and I'll give you one example, very simple one. Uh, actually, I can give you two. <laughs> um, I, I, I have unfortunately mistakenly omitted the aspect of policy dialogue. Policy dialogue, not only with governments, but with communities, the, the, the community leaders. It's very important. You have to build the trust. And this is where we come in. We are very good, uh, what we call, um, um, what is it, a, a broker. We're very, a very good broker. Because we can broker with governments, we can broker with the private sector, but with the community. So you build trust. 
Everybody trusts him. And that is very key. But working with male, male leaders in communities is very key. We had a project in Uganda where uh, we were uh, encouraging the farmers, the w mostly women, to grow trees in between, you know, what they call early farming, they call it now. Well, now today they call it agro agroforestry. And it was, you know, they all went, everybody was growing trees. And then one morning they all woke up and it, the, the, the shrubs were cut, was, were cut by, the, by, by the men. And why, 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 why did the men cut down the, the trees, the shrubs? Mm -hmm. Well, because in that community, when you plant a tree on a piece of land, you become your, your own. And these women cannot be taking the land from the men. But the men had not been consulted. So the project was going to fail. So finally, we had dialogue with the leaders and showed the men the benefits from these trees. We said, well, yeah, but the women cannot take their land because women do not own land. It's men. Now the tree cannot belong to us. So we had to cut them down. Finally, the arrangement was the trees belong to the men, but if you please let it grow so that the women can use the leaves to feed their, their goats and the fruits can be sold for the family. But when the trees were mature, they were cut down for electric poles and telephone poles and the men shared the money. <laughs> so everybody benefited. <laughs> the other one was actually former prime minister, pre president of, uh, of uh, Malawi, Joyce Banda. In the community where she was born, they were trying to bring some development, but it was difficult. One, the big problem was nutrition. But the tradition there was that when women are pregnant, they're not allowed to eat eggs, chicken eggs, because it was not good for the women. But it was, it was again a mindset. They couldn't change it. The, 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 the clinics, the midwives, and the nurses could not do anything. But the easiest thing a family can is, is you know, chicken, the local chicken eggs, and the women should be fed the eggs. So the way she did it was she went to the community leaders and said, you know, the child that your wife is carrying is your own child. That child, when it grows out to be a big man or a big woman, is your pride. So your, your wife has to eat well so that your child is <laughs> when he's born. So they had to convince to, to understand that the child is their child. To, in order to break a community uh, taboo, yeah. I mean, you may, it may sound ridiculous to you, but there are many parts in this world where certain things uh, cannot be done by, by women. I mean, go to, go to India, I can tell you, I lived there for 10 years, and you'll be surprised what happens in rural areas. So it's a question of, Gaining, gaining the, the, the confidence of the men. I think it's in, you know, in Sri Lanka, we also were able to, we succeeded in changing the land titling of farms such that it is owned by the husband and the wife. And when the man passes away, the land passes on to, to, to his wife, not to his brother, you see? And it took a lot of understanding of what will happen to your own children if you pass away before your wife, your children will not have any land. So you link it again to their own children. What will happen to the children? The tradition that gives it to the uncle or to your brother does not guarantee your children having access to the land. So it's little by little. I mean, and if it is just one out of many institutions that can help. So it's, it's getting other institutions also to, build, to start, development should start at the community level. Because when the communities take ownership, after we are gone, the practice continues mm -hmm. because they own it. But if they don't own it, the moment you turn your back or the money stops coming, they drop it and it ends. So the sustainability of any development efforts is ownership of the process by the community itself. I wish I have a, a crystal ball. <laughs> but one thing I must say though, when we go back to 2007-2008, it wasn't so much as the price crisis. It, it, is, it is good, and it's good economics for us to experience fluctuations, you know, in prices, in commodities. It's, it's good. It's very healthy. 
But the problem we experienced there was not just simple fluctuation, it's the hikes. Those hikes were caused by speculation. Agreed. Exactly. It's speculation. And people started to hold produce. And speculation is the biggest, what do you call it, elephant in the room. And it's, it distorts the whole market system. So if there's a way, you know, those that make this, those that gamble with these the systems mm -hmm. to avoid, price hikes is good because see, that's how people plan because it goes through cyc cyclical. You know, it's, it's, it's basically on, until we call it climate change, the cyclical changes. But it also is an incentive for people to produce. And you know, the, the irony of it is, when you think about it, even in that 2007, 2008, they said the was the world produced enough food to feed the population of the world. It produced enough food. The distribution of that food was the problem. Yes, yeah, so please go ahead, please. Yeah. Put on your mic. Waste. Yeah, 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 yes. Yes. I, th I think that's another discussion topic. Food waste and food loss and food waste. I agree with you. Food in that sense involving also the resources like water. I fully agree with you. I know that FAO and IFAD and some others supported by the Swiss Development Corporation. We have a project of that. I think if we can, frankly, achieve food waste in particular. Food waste in the developed world. Food loss in the developing world. We can actually balance the, the, the deficits. Mm -hmm. But again, if, 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 this is the problem. I think we have to have strict rules and regulations sometimes, you know, to really make restaurants that, you know, overcook, or when people uh, uh, throw away food, sometimes we just hold food, you know? Then you say, oh, the expiry date is no longer good. They throw it away. I can assure you that expiry food can feed people elsewhere. They will eat it. I mean, as a child, I grew up eating overnight food. My children, you give them an overnight food, they say, what, uh, no, mommy, I'm not going to eat this. Uh, it was from yesterday. Can you imagine that? <laughs> we grew up eating over, overnight food as breakfast before going to school. We call it, uh, we have a name for it in my language. But that was poor people's food. My father was a school teacher. He wasn't poor in those days. So it's again, it's again a mental, change in mental mi mindset. Absolutely. Yeah, changing habits. Exactly. Yeah. So thank you very much, Professor Nwanze, for your visit. Thanks to Ifat for your visit. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you.